Oh, okay. And that was a yes, right? Everyone can see my screen? Perfect. Yes. We can, but I think there may be a portion of it be cut off a bit, just but. Like... Okay, there we go. There we go. That... Better. Okay. I think it, it had to tell me that it was recording and then it started to act right. So the American uh, Rescue Plan Act of 2021, also called the COVID-19 Stimulus Package, or American Rescue Plan, like Duane had mentioned earlier, is a $1.9 trillion economic stimulus bill that passed um, that was passed by the 117th United States Congress and signed into law by President Joe Biden on March 11, 2021, to speed up the United States recovery from the economic and health effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing um, recession which we're still feeling the effects of. So the American Rescue Plan um, and the COVID relief uh, funds style um, breaks down for state and local funding. Um, it's estimated that about 1 billion for, for state plus another 1 million for, um, sorry, my screen just acted up, for COVID capital projects, there's estimated about 400, um, to 540 million for cities and towns, um, which we are a part of, um, and it's administered by the U.S. Treasury. Um, there are direct reward awards to um, specific areas, multiple specific awards for state agencies for dedicated purposes such as education and rental assistance specifically. Um, there's estimated at 100 million, 100, hundreds of millions in those specific categories. And that's also administered by multiple federal agencies. So there's money coming in from a lot of different avenues. Um, there's, there was also assistance to individuals and businesses that I think we've all um, witnessed or known somebody that has been a recipient of such as stimulus checks, enhanced unemployment, um, tax credits, and more for individuals and families. Um, businesses also receive support through PPP loans, there was some restaurant reliefs and other um, opportunities for business to get funding. So what does this include for Rhode Island? So coronavirus, coronavirus local recovery fund was about 130.2 billion. Um, Rhode Island's estimated at 540 million. There are some flexible funds for COVID relief and um, revenue replacement available for use for cost of incurred um, fees, um, effects to programs and different things like that through December 31st, 2024. So this isn't something that's just, you know, here today and the money's spent tomorrow. Here's really the Providence allocation and the breakdown. Approximately, as Duane mentioned earlier, 165.8 million in federal funding is coming to this specifically to the city of Providence. Um, there's a direct federal allocation of 131 million and then county level allocations via the state of 34.8 in that arena. Approximately 180 million in federal funding to Providence Public School District, 20% um, learning loss, which is about 31.3 million, uh, rem remaining LEA funds um, about 125.4 million and consolidated approximations at um, 23.8. 3 million. Um, there are eligibility uses for the funds, so it's not like we can go and paint the town red. Um, respond to the COVID public health um, emergency or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses, and nonprofits, or aid to impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. Um, provide premium pay to workers for performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency, provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the COVID-19 um, public health emergency and make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure um, it, as needed. Um, additionally, funds cannot be used to fund tax cuts or pension fund contributions, which I think is important. And that really does say that this is for um, improving the quality of life for many people. Municipalities can transfer funds to quasi agencies, nonprofits, or um, the state. Um, there is more information on the US Department of Treasury website 
Also, we do have a survey out right now where we'd love to hear your voice um, on our PVD rescue plan page. Um, some funds, there was an ordinance for the city of Providence, immediate needs for some funds to be used. And right now that total, um, if you look at the bottom of my screen was about 42 million. Um, that went to summer programming, youth investment, anti-violence investments, um, Roger Williams Park Gateway, grants to libraries, grants to nonprofits, relief to small businesses, grants to community centers, um, administrative funding, and um, revenue recovery. So definitely that was the first part of the ordinance. This, these funds have already um, been activated and put into use. Um, and we will be having um, a portion of our website that will explain, see the dollars in action, and we'll have more of a breakdown on these individually. But um, that was part of the initial ordinance when the funds were granted. Um, we do have a task force. The city established the COVID-19 Recovery and Resilience Task Force that began meeting weekly in July and includes representatives from the community, um, which uh, Councilwoman Nerva Lafortune is a, a part of and we thank her for her service. Meetings are open to the public and are posted on the open meetings portal. We do have a meeting this Friday at 1230 that you can join virtually or you can join in person, downtown city hall room 305. Um, COVID-19 Recovery and um, Resiliency Task Force will listen to the needs of the City of Providence as presented by City Department Directors, gather robust in input from Providence communities, which is exactly what we're doing tonight. We really want to hear what you have to say as residents, businesses, and any other interested parties. Um, weigh the interests of the Providence community members, especially those most impacted by the pandemic, and then provide their recommendations on how to further allocate the funding. So they're not choosing the organizations or the places the money that the money should go, but they are making recommendations. Um, public engagement, um, the task force is a great place to share your input. Community conversations like we're having tonight, another great place to share your input. We do have another one coming up next week at the DARE parking lot. I believe that is in person. Um, there are business, there were business, some business roundtables. I believe our last one happened yesterday. Um, and then you can also participate by taking the rescue plan funding survey, which you can find on the pvdrescueplan.com. Um, and that really does sum it up. Um, I think right now is a great time for open discussion. So if anybody, whatever's next on the agenda, Dwayne and Chanda, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Patrice. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite um, Angie and Coma, who co-chairs the um, task force, to articulate um, and uh, introduce herself and also articulate and add to what Patrice said about the purpose of the task force. Angie? Hi, Shonda. Good evening, everyone. I apologize. I didn't hear the last part of what you said. Um, I'm in a bed. Is that what you said, Shonda? I just asked you to quickly introduce yourself and just if you wanted to provide additional context for the purpose of the task force, that would also be helpful. Sure. And so, um, Askar Mayhouse was the president of the, um, yes. Please do, um, Nirva, if you can, if I, if I go out. Um, so uh, Oscar Mayhouse and I, and I believe there are maybe at least 14 task force members who um, are leading the task force. We meet weekly. Um, and each week we've had, um, as Patrice said, we've had a different uh, person um, come and present different ideas to us. Um, actually, let me back up for a second. Um, Angie Benjamin and Coma, I am a Providence resident, um, lived in Providence for over 40 years, Providence Public School graduate, and, um, and also a business owner in Providence as well too. Um, for work, I work at the Rhode Island Foundation um, and, and involved in a number of um, local initiatives um, re regarding the community. Um, and so I um, was on, uh, actually honored to be able to look at, uh, to be able to join the task force and really look at how we can 
um, one, hear from the community, but also look at how we can make sure the investments, um, the recommendations that are provided to the council and the leadership of the city um, are directed toward communities that are disproportionately impacted. And so, you know, I'm here just to listen in. Uh, fortunately, I have another conflict this evening, so I won't be here for the full time, but, you know, I appreciate everybody's time um, and coming together and providing feedback for the community um, and really looking forward to how we can provide recommendations to the mayor's office and to city council on how we can make sure that our communities that are uh, impacted um, can also look look uh, be ahead in terms of the recovery as well. And if um, I think last time when I joined the call, folks asked if there's a way they can reach out to the task force. I'm sure task force members can reach out. There's an email address, which I'm, I'm gonna ask one of the team members to put it in the chat box if they haven't already. Um, feel free to um, send your direct feedback or comments to that if you want to. Um, and if you want to reach out directly to me, um, you feel free and um, and I can also provide that as well to, um, to me or the other um, co-chair of the council or anybody on the task force for that matter. Thank you very much again. And thank you so very much, Angie, for your remarks and also listening here. And now we're actually going to ask another member of the task force to also give some remarks and info and uh, context. Paige Cautious Sparks. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. It's so nice to see so many of you, so many former colleagues on this call, so many young people. Uh, my name is Paige Cautious Parks. I am a senior policy analyst at Rhode Island Kids Count. Um, Rhode Island Kids Count is a statewide policy and advocacy organization that's dedicated to improving the lives of Rhode Island's youth um, with a strong focus on equity. Um, I've been appointed to be on this task force. I'm really honored um, to be on the task force. And I know this is a big responsibility that I don't take lightly. And you know, all of us on the task force are really dedicated to doing the right thing, um, giving the right recommendations um, for this really important funding. And we know so many folks have been impacted by COVID-19 and this is a great opportunity to um, try to fix some things. So we know there's a lot of ways this money can be used. So that's why we're turning to you. We really need to hear from you. So um, our, you are the voice and we're gonna do our best to hear everything you have to say. Um, so please tell us, like Shonda said, keep it real. We wanna know what's happening. We wanna know what your ideas are. If you have an idea, please feel free to submit a proposal on the website, take the survey, share the survey. We wanna hear from as many people as possible. Um, so thanks for having me here. I'm happy and excited to listen. Thanks, Dwayne. Thanks, Shonda, for hosting tonight. Thank you, Paige. And before we jump into the live conversation, because I, I see a lot of people with a lot of energy ready to really just jump in, I want to give um, Councilwoman Nerva um, La Fortune a, a couple of minutes because she was extremely critical in, in making sure that community voice was very much part of the spending allocation. So Nerva. Thank you, Shonda, and thank you, Arise, for uh, hosting tonight's community conversation. Thank you, Duane, um, task force members, community members. I see so many of you here today are young people, um, which is really important to make sure that your voices are part of this conversation, um, as well as um, the, you know, the consultants um, who are helping us in connecting with the community. So I had put in a uh, resolution before in the spring to create this task force to ensure that, um, that there was an equitable and transparent process in deciding how the city was going to uh, allocate funding um, from the American Rescue, and Pl um, Rescue Plan Act. Um, what was important for me um, and based on community input is that folks wanted to see real investments in our communities, in our, neighbor, uh, in our neighborhoods, in initiatives um, that directly impact Providence residents, that directly impact people who are part of the Providence community. And so it's really important that um, we hear your voices. Um, if you don't speak tonight, um, you can always fill out the survey. We ask you to tell friends, family members, people in your community to participate in these community conversations. There will be many more. Um, but most importantly, um, your voice matters. 
um, because this is a one in a lifetime opportunity. And we know that our city has some significant needs. Um, some of the um, things that have come up so far are people wanting, um, are, um, wanting to see investments in housing, um, in education, um, in safety, and supporting um, our community members who struggle with mental and behavioral health, um, in community centers and job development um, opportunities and training for our youth. Um, but again, in order for us to provide those recommendations, it's important that we hear from you um, and you will inform um, how we move forward. So I thank all of you for joining us um, this evening. Thank you for your time. And again, please um, fill out the survey. Even if you're here tonight, fill out the survey so we make sure that we are capturing um, um, your voice. And also please circulate it um, to ensure that people within your community are also a part of this conversation. Um, so thank you. And Shonda, I'll um, send it back to you. At this time, Dwayne and I would like to invite folks to share their comments. I already saw that there were some lively chats around prioritizing housing in Providence, but if folks would like to speak and come off mic, um, please just raise your hand so that Dwayne and I can help sort of facilitate this conversation. I also want to elevate that there are also a couple of other task um, force members here that you know, you can direct your questions to. So there's Julian that's here and there's Peter that's here as also task force members. So um, our job is to make sure that they answer your question. And yes, Pilar, I see your hand raised. Good evening. How is everybody doing? We good? Yes, praise God and hallelujah. So this is my question. Um, during the pandemic, I noticed that a lot of attention, rightfully so, was placed towards young people because we were talking about the impact the pandemic was having on their ability to be educated and go to school. But there is a other group that was kind of left out or kicked to the side. And that's what I put into the chat. So people who are disabled, senior citizens, and veterans. And I'm going to say those groups because those groups, nine times out of 10, pre-pandemic, went to some kind of senior center or some kind of day program. Um, I'm gonna use my mother as an example. She is a woman who is 86, she has dementia and she's disabled, but because she has dementia, she went to a program that was curtailed just for her at a senior center. Once COVID came, that center was closed. That center, even to this day right now tonight, has not reopened. So there's no services for her. But the impact on the household is she's gone from being out of the house six days a week to now being home all day, every day, seven days a week with yours truly. And I love my mother, but she can eat. So that is an impact. That is a bill. That is something extra that our household did not not only consider, but those all of those life skills that she's learned, she's now regressed because she's been home for over a year and a half. So I don't think we've considered that demographic of people, along with veterans who need services, and along with just those that are mentally capable, but physically disabled. So I want us to make sure that whatever plans we put in place, that we consider those demographics of people as well, not just our young people and those that are marginalized and low income, because these specific people or these areas are also marginalized because they are on a fixed income. They usually only get funds once a month. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I see also Ronnie Young and then James. Good evening, everybody. I appreciate you guys hosting this meeting. It's um, great that you know the city's taking steps to include the actual people who this money is going to impact to be a part of the process. Um, Pilar, what you said, it resonated so much with me. I have a grandmother as well who's been in the house for, I don't know, over a year and a half, and I've seen the regression in her as well. Um, but I currently manage a homeless shelter, and I don't want to forget about the homeless population. I, had, um, I have a shelter full of men that have no where to go um, and nothing to do. And I try to encourage them as much as possible to find a job, to, you know, find somewhere to volunteer, but I find it ever more difficult to find, um, you know, 
um, constructive things for these men to do. There were um, day shelters that were open during the day for these gentlemen or the homeless population in general. I, I specifically work with the male homeless population. So excuse me if I just say these gentlemen, but the homeless individuals, they were um, places for them to go during the day and a lot of things are closed. Um, and they just don't have access to. So I don't want to forget about that population as well. And then the, sorry, the mental health um, issues that are going on in the community are insurmountable. Um, and I see how it's impacting the homeless community. So I don't know if there's any funds that can be allocated towards, you know, revamping our rehab and the, in, the insurance and how that plays a role in this. I don't know, but I just feel as though the, you know, I don't want to forget about the homeless population. Um, we need resources to kind of make sure that they have constructive things to do. We need things to get them kind of involved in this process as well. Um, so that's what I really wanted to say about that. So I appreciate all of you guys for, you know, giving us this opportunity to speak. James, did you want to go? I didn't know if I, I didn't want to just cut in. Hi, son. Hi, everybody. Thank you for doing this. Um, this is actually my first time attending one of these. I know I've been put in, um, I think, some proposals uh, for criminal justice reform um, that people have done in regards to this, I'm thinking. But I want to say I applaud efforts that the city is doing, um, especially I know you're a part of this, Nerva, with uh, mental health and substance abuse in regards to these task force, especially because we have an opioid crisis, which is fueling homelessness, which is fueling uh, a lot of other issues. Um, and it's good. Uh, I want to bring us back, though, to the 80s and 90s when we failed to recognize the crack epidemic as a mental health crisis. And opioid, we, we recognize an opioid, but a majority of people who are using the substances are not people from like inner city neighborhoods. Um, during the crack epidemic, the 80s and 90s, it was not a mental health crisis. We were uh, criminals or, or super predators. That's what, that's what they call people. And they locked multiple generations up. Um, our communities were decimated. Uh, East side, I can name a lot of people. When I came home, I was like, where's so-and-so? Oh, he went away to the feds. And a lot of our programs were left to deal with their children. Um, programs were basically taking the brunt because most of their parents were locked up. A lot of these individuals are coming home. We have in road, we had a situation of mass incarceration, but a lot of these individuals are starting to come home now from these long sentences. And we have a situation where 30% of people in Rhode Island have a criminal conviction. Um, actually, those numbers are way higher for areas such as Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, and Woonsocket, because the data shows that most people who are released are not released to like these other areas, they're released to the inner city. And we have an enormous amount of people who are struggling with the collateral consequences, um, the residual consequences of having a criminal record, and they've been left out. And we know that they were wrong because we failed to, to diagnose uh, this problem in the 80s and 90s. And yet we are still failing to sort of like provide uh, some sort of rect rectification for the situation. And I think more needs to be done for this population because it makes up an enormous amount of our city. And if we could deal with that, I think a lot of, and from my own experience, I know dealing with my own issues and, and providing my own self with a sense of education and sustainability has had residual effects to everything around me. My children, or not only myself, my children, my community, and I work on the state level. So I would like to see something done, more done in regards to criminal justice reform, especially here in the city of Providence. Sorry, thank you. Thank you so very much, James, for your remarks and also identifying the uh, disparity, hypocrisy, the racism, and the responses between what we saw in the 80s and 90s with black and brown people and what we're seeing right now with predominantly white people in terms of substance abuse and addiction and usage. Um, with that, we want to kind of do a little bit, like we still don't listen to you, but we also have gotten some substantial feedback and we wanna open up the opportunity for any of our task force members to respond to what has been provided in feedback so far. 
um, whether it's questions, comments, um, or you know any insight you can provide in terms of if any of these topics have already been comment have already been brought up in prior meetings. I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, so thank you for, I've, I've been taking, taking a ton of notes as you all are speaking, taking notes in both the chat and um, the speakers. Um, and we have heard housing come up over and, and over and over again. So that's something that's um, def definitely top of mind because that's come up in many different forums um, as well as addressing mental health issues. I'm thank James tremendously for raising the issue of an attention to folks who are formerly incarcerated. Um, and I, I want to look at more of that data as well, too. I mean, kids kind of love data. So I will I would love to see that data too, to see um, we know as in terms of how that impacts children, children whose parents are um, in, in the justice system. I'd love to see on a on the broader scale as well for adults. So thank you that um, for me because I'm going to dig deeper into that. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Paige. And so yes, if any of the um, any of the task force members, again, hearing what you've received in terms of feedback so far, if you wanted to ask additional questions, comment, respond, um, acknowledge, we want to make sure in terms of this engagement, if you want to speak to any, uh, to speak to what Pilar, Ronnie, and James have provided in terms of that feedback so far, or what you're reading in the comments. Yeah. So I, I'll just add that. Um, so remember, our role in these conversations are to listen. So the task force has not made any type of decision. Um, but the recommendations that we make to the city will be informed by, by what you tell us, what you indicate in the survey. So um, yes, you know, housing, um, behavioral, um, and with behavioral, I'm also going to include James, um, you know, substance, um, you know, challenges and, um, and also mental health um, um, challenges. Um, all of those things, housing, all of those things, um, services for our elderly population. I mean, during the pandemic, I mean, people could not get their medication. <laughs> um, and, and also people were very isolated because they weren't going to those community centers and going to get coffee with you know, their friends or having people who might stop by on a regular basis to check on them. So all of these things um, are, are concerns um, um, and priorities that have come up. But again, our goal is to listen um, and to hear from you so that it can inform how we provide um, recommendations. And also, what are some um, effective ways in um, making funds available to some of our community entities that are already doing the work so that they could expand the work that they're currently doing? Um, so one thing I want to say, too, is I want to make sure that during this conversation, we also get to hear from young people um, because uh, a lot of the meetings that we have had um, have, you know, it's been mostly adults and I, I love all of you adults, <laughs> um, but you know, this is an opportunity too because whatever decisions that are made in terms like long-term, it directly impacts them. Thank you so very much, Councilwoman LaFortune. Um, just checking around, seeing if anyone has any raised questions. Um, I do know that there were some families, some people who could not make tonight's session, but they did have some questions as well. And we're still getting comments in, in the chat as well, so please keep them coming. Um, one of the questions did come to was, you just said we're having recommendations, but the final decision of ultimately what happens, who determines who gets the money? And then there was a question that came in prior discussions about oversight. Um, is the task force just gonna make the recommendations? But let's say the decision is made that money gets spent this way. Will this task force also be the persons overseeing who gets that money, how that money gets spent? Um, and then like, what is the like measurable results in terms of like, how do we determine how we uh, measure success or how we accomplish our goal? 
And again, it's something which any of the task members can acknowledge, answer, respond to, or just note that it's something that there's a question from the community. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Julian. Um, I can try to answer part of that. I'm one of the task force members, really grateful to be here and grateful to you all for hosting this and for everyone for taking time out of their evenings to participate. Uh, time is a valuable resource and so I really appreciate that from everyone. Um, I'm a resident of Washington Park. I um, have been here since 2013 and in Providence before that. Um, and I've spent the past year and a half working, I've been at the Department of Health for seven years uh, have been working on the COVID response, uh, specifically focused on Central Falls and Pawtucket, uh, who are also very hard hit with COVID for the past year and a half. Uh, to answer your question uh, posed just now, Duane, uh, I think that's an open question that we have as well. Um, the, 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 the thing that we've been tasked with uh, is to really engage with uh, community priorities, hear from what different city departments are proposing and make a set of recommendations, which are then sent to city council. Uh, my understanding is that city council is making the final decision on where the funds go in collaboration with the executive branch mayor's office um, as usual, but that it's a city council decision. Uh, I would love to be able to be involved in that kind of follow-up and accountability, um, but that has not really been brought up to us at this point. Uh, but I think that's something that we all collectively as residents of Providence uh, need to kind of be following up on and kind of seeing what ends up happening with this over the next three years is my understanding of when the funds can be used by. Uh, and then one last thing in terms of other forums, um, in addition to the weekly meetings that we've had, I uh, also, there's been a series of other community forums. Um, a few weeks ago, was able to participate in the Latino Policy Institute's uh, one and, and heard some similar things there. Again, like Paige said, housing has been a huge, huge one that comes up over and over again. Uh, and something that I just wanted to say on, on that and what else we've heard, um, I think it is true and it's important that really, um, it really important for the, there to be public engagement and decision making around these funds uh, and to understand that <clears throat> this is a unique opportunity. Um, at the same time, uh, once the kind of things that are already set in place of funds that have already been allocated or that are kind of by the, the, the law and the way they've been put out um, can be used for kind of cost recuperation, it's less than $100 million that's really kind of at play for decision making around this. Um, and, and it is, in my perspective, a bit of a, to see that as, as so transformational is a bit depressing. Um, when the need is so much greater than that. There are so many resources, this is an ongoing need. And so yes, it's really, really important that we uh, put these funds towards good use and towards the true uh, needs in the community. There are many, many intersecting crises that have been crises long before COVID hit and COVID made all of it worse. Uh, and so we have to address this and, and look, you know, with intersecting crises, we need intersecting solutions. And so I'm really looking personally looking for things that aren't siloed approaches, um, but really address multiple issues at the same time was said, the intersection between substance use, criminalization, housing, employment, those are all related. They all need to be addressed together. Um, but just point pointing out that, you know, that, that 100 million or so that we have, uh, when we look at tax stabilization agreements, when we look at what the state has access to, when we look at the cost of the police budget every year, things like that, uh, it is not that big compared to what else is out there and that we need policy changes as well, that we can't put all of our eggs in this one basket. Uh, that this needs to be used in a, in a strategic and focused way, but we can't forget about all the other funds that are out there that are not necessarily being invested in ways that support communities and are actually going to the detriment and, and going against what the community priorities are. Uh, so it's not the only thing out there, but it is a very, very important thing. So because we have no hands up right now, um, I want to um, ask Abby to elevate some of the comments um, some of the important comments that are, are being um, sort of lifted up. Thanks, Shonda. One that I saw from Lisa was that when contracting for structural improvements, a certain percentage of the workers or laborers should be Providence residents. I guess the idea is that money should go to support, to local support and not out, to use your words, Lisa, outside carpetbaggers, I'm with you, who are just trying to make a dollar and not invested in our community. And I think this sort of ties into what Julian was just saying. Like there is that Providence First Ordinance that, you know, when the, the city does give money for tax stabilization agreements, there should be pro Providence workers and people benefiting from those. And so um, really great point. And I, I think something to consider that it's not just the funding, it's, it's also the policy and what we're putting behind um, the funding that goes out. There is a hand up and I'll get my next comment ready, Shonda. 
Kara? Hello, I'm Kira Wills, and I can't see very well with these glasses on, so let's take that off. So what I wanted to say is that the comments that were made in reference to the elderly and the disabled, um, to give a little bit something a little bit more specific towards that, I really believe that there needs to be funding that would help them in reference to technology and supports regarding employment. And when I say employment, I mean programs for training and actual work programs, because the pandemic has most certainly highlighted for us that the people who are elderly, new immigrants, um, as well as disabled, have been discounted in the workforce. And the pandemic has definitely shown us that all workforce eligible people are needed, and technology has been set aside for specific groups, but not for ones to become more dependent. People that are on a fixed income or on an income that is greatly reduced because of monthly receipt of income would benefit from contracts for um, employment as well as training to advance themselves to be a little bit more self-sustaining. That can be done in tandem with youth programs that are currently already existing because there's a lot that they could learn and build together with entrepreneurship, with mentorships, with a lot of different things. And I think that that's not something that has been accounted for in the past and should be going forward. As along with that, I think what we also need to find out is what does it mean in reference to quasi agencies that are eligible to receive the funds? Because as we know in Rhode Island and Providence is no stranger to this, it's I know a guy, I know a guy, I know a guy who is going to receive the contracts, who's going to receive the funding. And it might be the same 25 people with different executive leadership that doesn't really reflect the full demographic of the citizenry and residency of the city or the state that gets to do it, but we don't give it to organizations that may not be nonprofits or are working with nonprofits, but could benefit from having that money to build capital for themselves, to build things that would be beneficial to people within the city. And I'm not certain if they're allowed to have that. Is that something that will be allowed with this funding? Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kara. Um, just thinking of time-wise too, um, we do have another hand raised, Jeremy Costa, if you want to come off and you can ask your question. Yes, how are you? You guys, uh, I sat back and just kind of analyzed a lot of this and took in consideration everyone's concerns. But what I don't hear is sustainability. This is a one-time fund. And so you guys all know that I am, um, going to put in a foolproof plan in regards to an ATV park that's going to facilitate the mental health, the uh, nurture, the programming, and all those other things that you guys were just talking about so much in this uh, hour uh, in a presentation in a few locations that that could actually be a location that could probably create an opportunity for a lot of these youth that you see that are um, disenfranchised from that or from that pandemic and that epidemic that we're dealing with of the 42F and these other programs that have been used to marginalize this specific group of people. And this could truly liberate them. The other thing is, I think we really gotta, we really gotta focus on is uh, investment. Investment as in, why aren't we creating like insurance companies for these individuals? Why aren't we creating bank banking opportunities, creating new ways and, rep, and, and opportunities where these people have a way to be able to borrow and create, um, like if they go through a financial um, you know, literacy course, that they're able to borrow money from a fund that they wouldn't be able to borrow from to get them from that um, you know, s situation. So that's what needs to happen. And that, that you know, when you borrow money, you got to pay it back. And so when you do that, that fund is going to actually create opportunity to create more opportunity for others that come in. So we need to start thinking generationally what this one-time fund is going to do. We can't just send it and spend it on, you know, a specific 
we have to make sure that we invest this money. So of course, real estate is, has to be an idea, but we also have to look at the idea of investing in solar panel trust corporations and maybe investing, you know, to where if these kids sign up for this, they get a first, they get their first hundred and fifty dollars, you know, if they sign up for a Coinbase product or a, I mean, a um, class, or if they sign up for a real estate class or something, when we incentivize them and they get like some type of money. And that money is like set up in a trust and that can create wealth. I think we need to be able to think in that manner. So we need to really step back, I think, before we just start spending this one time fund and then have no supply chain to cre to generate more income from it. Thank you so very much. Does even one want to respond? Oh, yes. Councilwoman Lefort. Yeah. So, Jeremy, thank you for that. So we actually talked about sustainability in our um, in our meeting. Um, the task for meeting, um, task for me, um, task force. Oh my goodness, it's late and I'm, you know, tired and tongue tied. Um, in our task force meeting, um, because all the task force task force members are concerned that we don't want to, um, you know, provide recommendations, but then there's no infrastructure to continue the initiative. One of the things that we've seen um, here in our city and our state throughout the country is that, you know, when when, when there are certain fundings that come in, then we start all these new things. And then once the funding runs out, then they die. Um, and there's no mechanism to keep them going. And that's why we have talked about, well, how do we create an infrastructure where we're not recreating the wheel, we're not always creating something new, but one, supporting initiatives that are already going on so that we can um, allow these organizations, these grassroots community-based organizations to continue and expand the work that they're already doing. Um, and also just going back to the point, um, someone uh, made the point about, you know, you know, what is the process? You know, will there be accountability measures? Um, that is also important, but part of, again, this conversation is you also telling us, well, how would you see us, how would you like um, this, this funding to be accessible? What are the best tools um, that we can use, that we can think about um, to increase the accessibility um, and so that people um, can have access to it, um, are, are know about it, um, or organizations know about it. Um, and also there's a way for us to um, make sure that there are, there's a level of oversight so that if someone um, submits a plan and say that they're going to use the funding for X, Y, and Z, they use the funding for X, Y, and Z. Um, and one of the things I will say, there are guidelines um, that are attached to the funding, um, federal guidelines that also should be followed because this is federal um, dollars. Um, so that require us to establish um, you know, some sort of mechanism of oversight or, or accountability, because then, you know, the feds will come after the city. Uh, um, so there's definitely, um, we definitely have been um, having that conversation, but sustainability has been one of um, the type priorities um, to think about how do we make sure whatever is done, however this funding is allocated, it's something that, um, that can go on and that can be built upon as well. Great. Thank you so very much, Councilwoman LaFortune. And I'm actually following up. There's a comment from CARE on that. You know, of the core groups or the core areas of some of the survey, has there been a review of what is actually working beneficially in those sectors right now and what needs might be best, uh, best those in terms of allocation? So if I'm understanding you, CARE, have we already done an assessment of what are those organizations, groups, initiatives, programs, activities that we know that we have seen success with and may Maybe as a kind of a, as I already identifying those options in advance of we've already seen great outcome success and that that those are possible recipients of those funds. I don't know if that's been done, but Kara, please correct me if I'm wrong with uh, that. Okay, I, I see that that's what they meant. So. And I've seen another chat is, um, yes, they can be used for environmental justice um, in terms of the money. Um, I want to be mindful that it's also 6.30, and so we do have another at least half an hour for more comments, questions, concerns. Thank you so very much for everyone who's using the chat. And as you're using the chat, we also welcome anyone who is uh, brave enough to also come off mute to uh, like I said, ask a question, make a comment, state a, a, a request. Um, Jeremy, do you have another question? Because your hand is still up. And then we have the hand up for Peter. 
No, well, I, I just wanted to kind of circle circle back, but um, so the the bike park again. I I really think that this is something that you know, and and I think that you guys facilitate a good group, and so I have a couple of people that um, might or might not be a part of this group today, but you know, I think that it's very important to get the um, the voice of the youth. So I did, I really don't want to speak much on this, um, and I and I want those people that are you know, playing a role to listen, but also I think that you guys really need to take a look at this because I think it will destroy a lot of the issues, especially the, um, you know, the issue of mental health. I think that this is a very important thing that we need to kind of see the similarities um, and, and we need to get down to business because it's a very small budget line item and it can be uh, not only handle your nuisance, but it also will eliminate the police on the street because there will be policing less and then so we'll have less hotline use. And so we'll be saving money um, in our municipality instead of spending it. So it actually kind of pays for itself. And then you have memberships or whatnot that keep it open or you know fees like you do a beach. So that's sustainability. And so we need to be able to create these opportunities. You know, If they're gonna be paying for tickets and suspensions, why don't we reward good behavior by you know, keeping them condensed in an allocated zone. So we, and, and the structure is there and, and it's proven to, to work. And if we create an opportunity where we create an amnesty with their license and their ability to drive, if they go through a six month program of keeping their bike within these vicinities limits and so forth without, you know, any tickets, we start rewarding that good behavior. We start getting productive individuals in society just by a byproduct of the nurture and in, in, in the time that we spend. So we need right. to start thinking about those investments um, right. and be Thank proactive. You so, All right, Thank sorry. you. And so, and, and no, so and remember there was the survey link. We can put that in there for those young people, particularly those Providence resident youth. We want to hear from them. We want to make sure we're capturing their voices. Please make sure Correct. you get c- c- circulate that survey link so that they're completing it. We're getting that feedback. What we're really basically emphasizing is that residents, particularly our youth, We'll drive that, but we also have to hear from them directly. So I'm loving it that you're bringing up those that feedback. Please get them that survey to complete it as well. Thank you so very much, uh, Peter, then James, and then Abby. Hi, I'm Peter Ace, and I'm a member of the task force, and I work at the Providence Housing Authority. I just wanted to say one thing in response to Kira's question, which is that the the task force has been to some extent looking at, we've had different city departments basically presenting on what is happening now as well as the needs and the gaps. Um, however, that has mostly been coming from city, uh, city staff and city departments and not really from agencies. I know that the task force is planning, I believe for next week to potentially hear from a few like agencies doing work on the ground in the community as well. But that's not an area we've heard as much aside from say in some of these forums. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to add about Julian's comment earlier and it, this may have been mentioned before, but I think it is important to note that, you know, Providence has this 160 million, but the state also has 1.1 billion. And it can certainly go to support things in Providence as it should, as the biggest city and a city with a lot of need um, and a city that's so important to the well being of the whole state. So I do think to the every need in the city that for city residents to be advocating with the General Assembly members. Um, when they're passing some kind of budget for these state funds, um, that that is an important next piece that, that we need to do to, to make sure that, that the state also addresses some of these same needs. And, and they really do, uh, maybe it could be done in a way in coalition with neighbors in Pawtucket and Central Falls and other communities that, that are facing some of the same issues. Thank you so very much for raising that, Peter, especially with the General Assembly. I sometimes do think we forget that, yes, we're focusing on the city money because this obviously the city of Providence, but we also want to remind you, yes, our state of Rhode Island did receive a significant, much more amount of money. And so make sure to contact your state rep, state senator about that funding in the governor's office as well. And we can provide you that information if you want to narrate more about that process. Um, let's keep the time going because we're getting close to the seven. James. Real quick. I... It's like what 160 million, Dwayne? It's uh, one 165.8 million for the city of Providence. 
that remains. Remember, there was 42 million that was also received that was already allocated and uh, sent out by city council this past summer. I don't know if people realize like we spend almost double that every year on incarceration here in Rhode Island. Um, to incarcerate one male is $70,000 a year. To incarcerate one female, it's $121,000 a year. And to incarcerate one youth, it's over $200,000 a year that we are spending on incarceration every year. Um, for that, because we're not, I think it's less than 1% is actually being spent on programs and rehabilitation for these individuals to successfully reintegrate back into society. And for that, we're getting 60% of these individuals will go back to prison once they're released because we've done nothing to prepare them to come home. Um, and I think if we put the up, nobody wants to put the upfront investment. Nobody, everybody knows we have to put an upfront investment in order to lower the cost of incarceration here in Rhode Island. Um, and I think if we could lower that cost for incarceration, then we have sustainability because all this money we keep sending up to Cranston uh, to incarcerate mainly Providence, Pawtucket, mainly our, our, our people, right? Um, all this money could be used in this state for programs and other things, roads, whatever. We're wasting a lot of money on incarcerating our people. And I think we need to do something as far as some sort of upfront investment to change this residual effect of recidivism and incarceration. Sorry. Thank you so very much. Very well noted. Before we get you to Abby, I just want to get to clarify something in the chat. Julian, you said that you know, I want to make sure that we're being very open and direct in terms of clarifying. My understanding is that 42 million already allocated. We have 165.8 million remaining. If I'm understanding your comment, you're saying the 165 is all together. We've already spent 42 million. We yeah. really only have 121, 22 yeah. remaining. Yes. And what, I, what I was saying earlier that really what, what we as a task force have kind of the ability to, to have a say over. And again, it's, you know, we're making a recommendation. We don't have the final say, but it's less than 100 million um, because there is a provision in the federal ARPA law around revenue recuperation. So the city budget took a big hit during the pandemic and it continues to uh, with a lot of lost revenue from hotel taxes and things like that. And so the city is able, there's a formula that, the, that all cities, not just Providence, but all cities who received funds can use to calculate for the next three years, how much revenue will be lost and kind of restore that amount to the general city budget. So it's still money that the city has, but it's part of the general budgeting process and it's being pulled out from the overall amount. So what we're left with is, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it's a little bit under a hundred million in terms of new investments for existing programs, services, things through city departments and resources that could be put towards. Thank you so very much for that clarification. And just for a kind of follow-up feedback, if we're right now, we've been told, we were sitting here promoting 165.8, someone who's receiving that, that could be received as being deceptive. So I want to just caution that going forward with the communications being very clear of exactly what's going on and not being that detail, but being very clear saying we have X amount left versus we want to give feedback on this amount because for our audience listening, they're under the anticipation we have this amount remaining or this amount to play with when actually it's much less. I think just for accuracy and for avoiding any type of uh, messaging being received in, in a different way, we want to be just very clear about that. Um, let's just get to Abby because we've got 20 more minutes. Thanks, Dwayne. I just wanted to lift up a comment from Liana or Liana. Um, who asked about, uh, is there an opportunity to distribute funds to city residents by way of basic universal income check? Um, there are many families, single parents, multi-generational, first-generational immigrants who face very real financial challenges brought on by the pandemic. Um, and I'll answer that question. The answer is yes. And that's something that some cities and states are looking into. Maybe it's not exactly the universal income, but direct stimulus checks. So drop it in the survey if that's something you think is a good use. Also, I want to elevate that um, JG has been lifting in the chat as well around folks who, if you know folks or if you are somebody that's facing sort of a housing crisis, please contact DARE. Their information is 340 Lockwood Street in Providence. 
Um, and if you, and if you are, if you've already spoken, you have your hand up. If, can you put it down so that we know that you're not asking to speak again? And Etienne, if you want to come off mic. All right, cool. Sorry. Yes. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for calling on me and having me. I'm uh, Etienne, or you call me E if it's easier. Uh, just quickly, just wanted to um, uh, reiterate that. Yeah, I certainly agree with things being sustainable, which a lot of programs are well-intentioned, but they often aren't sustainable long-term unless there's other funding sources. So um, it's kind of a tease in a way. So there's nothing more sustainable than, than jobs, jobs training. There's so much, there's a huge uh, shortage in trades. You know, people in the minority community, province community should be taking advantage of that. That's real sustainable uh, work over long-term that could really put, you know, bring you from you know, lower class to middle class and, and beyond. So I'd love to see something like that. Uh, you know, this could pay for a year program, a two-year program or more. And, and can make a real difference. Um, and being that it's under $100 million, and I'm sure that could eat, get eaten up pretty quickly, uh, lower price items like uh, quality of life issues, cleaning up, graffiti, you know, certain areas, it's just, you know, inundated with graffiti, no one seems to care, trash cleanup. And and speaking of infrastructure that's already there, the Amos House is doing a pretty good job of doing that on the south side, wherever a house. Um, so, you know, they clean up, you know, you can have them do it. It employs them, gives them a, a, another skill as well. So I think that would be a great. And a uh, question for whoever can answer, uh, what percentage of the uh, less than 100 million now do you think is going to go to big ticket items, education, health care, and um, education, health care, and uh, I'm sure there's, there's another one, but some of the some of the bigger items, because I'm, I'm curious to know what would be left for, for other things. Obviously, there's, there's, there's big ticket items that eat up a lot of the budget. Thank you. Um, there, I, I know that there are separate funds from um, for education, right? In each district, um, um, is supposed to be engaging um, engaging community members to decide on how those funds are being spent. I know a, a group of organizations, including Arise, have developed a fact sheet with um, Kids Count and Cycle on how we believe the the fund should be allocated. But there is a separate fund for that. And it's actually 123 million left. Great. I see another hand up, Alexandria. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon or good evening. So I have a, a few things I want to say. So in regards to um, the governor's statement recently upon investing into small businesses. I'm not disagreeing with that at all, but I think that investments need to be put towards social enterprise um, and reinvestments into people's lives and the future of our Rhode Islanders. Um, you know, in terms of we, we, we're in a whole homeless crisis. We've been in a whole homeless crisis prior to COVID-19. COVID-19 just was able to create some light in some spaces, but you know, um, there should be pathways and byways for me to be able to streamline people directly to James, right? Like there shouldn't be, I shouldn't have a question of, do I have enough money to pay for this kid's sober house prior to him getting into a uh, re-entry campus? And it just seems like, I understand focusing on small businesses, but that's all for profit. So you're you're seeding individual small households, but you're not actually affecting a community as a whole. Right. And, and you are in, in small interval pieces. So it's like a short term solution. But the long term solution needs to be that there needs to be services that are like I when when somebody says, OK, Alex, I'm ready to do the right thing. And, you know, we have all these things lined up. OK, somebody has to pay for his weekly rent at the sober house. He needs a clothing stipend. Right. He needs transportation stipend. He needs all these different things for us to continue to seed him so he can get to the next step so he doesn't get back up, end up in jail. And all I continue to hear them say to me is, well, Alex, if I go back to jail, I know that I can eat, sleep and not have to worry about anything. That's disgusting. So, like, is there a way that we can start to incentivize people's organizations upon uh, key performance indicators? Because I feel like if we were looking you know, directly at those things and about like, if we just look at the people that I've served, the people that James has uh, seeded into these people's life due to his own life struggle, we would be able to change this whole state. It's very easy. Um, 
you know, but like, why is it that this money is not trickling down to the folks that really need it? Because I don't see any of this money going to the people that make under $40,000 a year that really need the funds. I don't. Um, so how do we streamline that process? And in terms of all the recommendations that we're making, who actually has the authority to say, you know, yes or no? And, and when that happens, is it a whole procurement process where you got to wait 30 to 120 days? You know, and, and is this really American rescue funds? Because we should be rescuing people out of their situations and not causing them to beg for the crumbs that we so sparingly decide to offer. Thank you so very much, Alexandria, for your remarks and also highlighting what really is an ongoing issue but hasn't been said, poverty. And so we need to say it, we need to put it out there, we need to be very direct as to what is actually happening in the city. I want to be mindful we have 13 more minutes left and I do see another hand raised from Jax with the city of Providence. Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm not looking right at the screen. My camera's like a little off. Um, so I wanted to share a couple of things. I don't have answers to all of the questions. Um, we do have um, our new program specialist who's working with Rescue, Rescue Plan, Patrice Jean-Philippe, um, on this call. She may or may not be available to answer some of these questions, but Patrice, if you are, um, can you come on camera after and just introduce yourself and let folks know who you are? You know, she's a good point of contact and in many ways is right with a lot of you and a lot of your concerns around equity, inclusion, and access. I think um, I can see that this is a, uh, a more robust community engagement process for the city. And so we're building the capacity um, to do this. And so I wanted to thank you all for all of the input that you're giving us. It is being noted and we're working hard to make it happen. So I wanted to share a couple of things specifically for the group. Um, I wanted to tell you, um, so yes, 42 million has been allocated but not all of it has been spent. So there are currently some re live requests for proposals out in order to find providers for some of the programming that we want, that, this, that uh, some of this money has been allocated for. And I wanna show you how to find it. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, so I want, can you see, Abby, can you see that? Great, okay. So I wanna share two things. So first, how do you find um, the request for proposals that are out currently for the city, right? Money that is allocated but needs a provider. So what you want to do is go to providenceri.gov. And here under top requests, you can see the Providence Rescue Plan. Um, and at the bottom here, it says bid opportunities. And that's where you want to click. <clears throat> And here you can see all of the requests for proposals that the city currently has out. Of note for ARPA, we currently have out a City of Providence mentoring project for young people. And we also have a citywide nonviolence training that's specifically looking for folks who work with historically underinvested communities, including uh, communities of color, LGBTQ communities, uh, folks without homes, previously incarcerated folks. So if any of these two bids are something that you or a community organization that you're a part of is interested in applying for, please go and check this out. So these are live until October 12th. If you need technical support to fill out these proposals, please reach out to us via the contact form on the Providence Rescue Plan website, uh, which is here at the bottom. Uh, you can also email the email that uh, we sent out earlier, which is pbdrescueplan at providenceri.gov, and Abby will throw that in the chat. <clears throat> and lastly, I don't, uh, the last thing I'll say is that you can see the uh, last ordinance that was passed and exactly where the money went on our website on the About page. If you click that link, it will show you the actual ordinance here taking a second to load and you can see exactly what was what uh, was allocated and for what so I wanted to share some of those tools directly with you again this is all reiterated on our website but since y'all are here in person I uh, wanted to share that okay that's it I wanted to also go back to Alexandria's question um she had asked so 
who gets to decide, um, who gets the final decision on sort of resource allocation. And what I've heard earlier was that it was the responsibility of the task force to elevate the needs of the community and make these recommendations to this Providence City um, Council and they would have the final say, is that correct? Yes, I believe that's correct. And so as everyone knows in terms of three branches, okay, equal branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial, legislative branch of the council approve, you know, will vote on it. Obviously, the mayor will sign it to law, the, the funding, and then the, the executive branch city then moves forward in terms of dispersing that. So in terms of final decision, in terms of the city's funds, we know that that city council, again, for state, that will be general assembly, just elevating that. Um, and then understanding where you want to go. But we, we do want to, again, make sure that the task force is receiving the feedback of you um, between now and this period so that that gets captured and those are included in the recommendations that go to, um, that are in that final report that then goes to the city council. And that I would be remiss not to elevate the multiple comments about multi-year funding for youth organizations and the work that they do. Um, and I also, with eight minutes left, I'd like to provide some space um, for young people to ask their questions or to provide their suggestions on how these funds should be used. Um, if you are nervous about coming on mic, please feel free to also put in the chat. I'd like to add something really quick. Um, so earlier I mentioned, wait, is it okay if I go? <laughs> First of all, sorry. Okay, thanks Shonda. Um, so earlier I mentioned a little bit about environmental justice. So um, I would like some resources to be um, allocated to that because there are like the air pollution, the air quality in Providence is really bad. And that's why we have higher rates of asthma and all that. So, um, yeah, I think some fun funding should be allocated towards that. I know there's a climate justice plan that uh, Mayor Larza put in place, but I'm not sure how that's going. So, yeah, I would like to see that happening because all these health effects like diabetes, heart disease, and all that could be developed because of the environment we're in. So just would like people to bring awareness to that and let our community members know that their health problems might be caused by all this pollution and how do we take care of ourselves and drink safe water. Thank you so very much for sharing and you're absolutely correct. It is so connected not only to health, but that also determines if you can even go to school, if you can work. It is so key to your overall quality of life. And we have the highway, we have the Port of Providence, we have so much going on in Providence that's contributing to the air quality, the water quality. So we definitely want to uplift that in this information. Thank you. And there's a comment that is just noted, let's not duplicate efforts, but hold those accountable who are funded to address issues and make impact expected. And so thank you so very much, Denise, for uplifting that comment, because yes, there is, uh, as we heard earlier, there is an ordinance that's already in place that's supposed to ensure employment for city residents per source. Is it being enforced? You know, so are there things that we already have in place that we just actually need to do as part of the accountability please? So thank you. Um, and we have five minutes left. Can I, can I say one more thing? I'm sorry, it's Alex. Sure, um, in regards to bids um, and when the city puts out proposals, requests for proposals, um, it would be nice if the city would get more community engagement around the people that these bids are actually serving. Um, because, you know, in recent uh, events, I refused to submit to a proposal due to the severe disconnect of setting up everyone for failure. So I just feel like... Um, you know, James says it best, like the people that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. 
So we need to have those people's voices heard in regards to any type of services or a customer proposal that would go out by the city for them. Thank you, Alexandra. If there aren't any last minute thoughts, we'd like to encourage you all to um, also complete the online surveys. Um, we were told that we need to get those submitted by October 8th. So I'd recommend y'all do it October 4th. That's when we're getting ours in. Um, so if you know you you have sort of um, folks who really could not show up today or to the any other community um conversations you can elevate their voices by having the surveys filled out and we were assured that the survey results would be um uh public information this process would be completely transparent so that is a mechanism that we as community members could use um and how that replicates to task force recommendations and how the task force recommendation then aligns with what is being approved by the Providence City Council. Um, so please, so please fill out those um, surveys. And we also have surveys um, translated in um, the Southeast Asian languages and in Spanish as well. And also for those uh, who may have challenges with access to technology, please let us know as well. We do have alternatives. If they, for whatever reason, the online survey can't be completed by a resident, we can make alternative adjustments or arrangements so that, again, we still capture their voice in the, in the feedback. So it's uh, a part of the recommendations. Thank y'all for showing up. It is a Wednesday night. Um, so, and again, I wanna applaud everyone for, for really elevating it, your voices and keeping it real. Um, this is, I believe the fourth community, um, is it the third or fourth? And I just want y'all, this is the most attended um, for all the ones who have sort of hosted theirs thus far. Um, and I wanna just give love and a shout out to the young people who showed up, who I know are gonna be completing those surveys. Are you are y'all ready to close, Shonda and Blaine? Okay. Yep, it's uh, 6.59, so, you know, less than a minute, but obviously uh, for those who attended, they have a way of reaching out to us. So we can always note that we can still continue on this conversation out of this session as we still move forward, getting that feedback to the task force. And I also wanted to say thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you for the task force members who were able to join us. Uh, thank you to the youth, to the residents, all who joined us. Thank you, Shonda, for an arise for you know leading in terms of making sure being one of the co-hosts of the participants and inviting the South Providence Disabled Association to join you in terms of making sure we provide these outlets for our residents, particularly those who are historically excluded and have been not part of or directly invited to such per, uh, settings in the past to have this opportunity to really direct how this money that we all paid for with taxpayer money gets spent. Thank y'all. Have a good night. All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you.